Good evening and welcome to another episode of What's So Funny, the show that probes the minds, the brains, the psyches of the people who bring you the funny. And tonight, we catch up with Eliza Schlesinger, who last visited the show in 2010, or 2010. I'm not sure how you say that, but she was here a couple years ago. Since then, the former last comic standing champion has uh, gone on to host the dating show Excused. Maybe you've seen it. It's on late at night here in Vancouver. But she's still got time for us. Eliza was in town last weekend. I sat down with her one afternoon. And we talked comedy, Canada, and dating. Okay, Eliza. Nice to chat with you again. Nice to see you again. The two of you. Me and Blanche. You and Blanche. Last time I saw you, when was that? 2010? When were you here? I think so. The only time you've been in Vancouver. Yeah, I don't remember. Is yeah, maybe 2010. That sounds good. Yeah, sure. We'll do that. All right. That's a good and, one. And I know you love Vancouver. I do love Vancouver. Because I read your tweets and you said, I love Vancouver in caps. I meant it. I love coming to Canada. Well, clearly, because you wrote it in caps. That's, that's I usually write most things in caps because I want attention. <laughs> but I meant it. It was a, a deliberate statement and I meant it. Last time you were in uh, New Westminster and now you've moved up to the big city. Yes, I did not realize that it was, I thought this, I thought Yuck Yucks had bought that club and i also thought that it was the same area i didn't realize how huge vancouver was there you go so now it's just me and blanche in the city you uh travel with blanche everywhere i do and uh blanche is sitting on your lap right now i even saw blanche on jimmy fallon that was her big debut showing um, her vagina her dog vagina and then he let her come sit on the desk afterward and it was great it was an acmatic point in her career and we're all very proud of her now does she get paid for that doesn't get paid, but there was like an animal rights person there to make sure that the animal was being treated well. And that bothers me because I'm like, it's my dog. Yeah. What you... Whatever I want to do with her, I'm like, clearly not beating her on TV. And I'm like, this some creepy guy who like looked like he should have been otherwise homeless. And he's like, I'm just here to make sure. I'm like, I wouldn't trust you with an animal. <laughs> You're just have a creepy <laughs> presence. So don't question my parenting. I've made her a star. She is a star and the most well behaved dog I've ever seen. I got to say. I think she's mildly autistic. I got to be honest. There's just no reason she would be this calm all the time. Yeah, sitting in a bag. Loves the bag. Loves to be around people. And running around the club here. We're at Yuck Yucks, where you're performing this weekend. You need to put that down? Put down. Put her down. Even though... All right. Goodbye. How's your iron? My iron? Yeah. You're cold. You shouldn't be cold. I'm, I'm cold. I think women get colder easier than men do. My nose is cold, and I'm not wearing socks. I have a very, very thin <laughs> tank top on under this, which is a mistake. Well, it is summer-like here. It's summer-like, and I thought I would be outside more, and uh, quite frankly, I just didn't pay attention when I was packing, and that's really what it comes down to. So I'm going to go shopping later. <laughs> Today, actually, is the first day of fall, isn't it? Is it? That makes... Is it Thursday? Yeah, I think it is. That makes me and every girl happy, because if there's one thing girls love, it's fall. Why? We just because love of the it. dead leaves? Uh, we love death, and it's just you get to where... Uh, this is not so girly, but like, if you go on like Pinterest or any... like girl like website it's always like oh my god fall is here because you get to wear leggings and uggs and scarves and it's a big change up from the summer look which is something totally but, unrelatable to but you. you love the summer look i'm not a, i do love the summer look but i'm very very pale so i can't pull it off like most girls i don't tan easily no so it's not so fun for me because i don't look super cute in shorts really i'm very very white I thought you look super cute all the time i oh thank you and I'm not just saying that. You know. No, you're not. I know that. I know you mean it because you put it in caps. <laughs> <laughs> Verbal caps. You have a thing for Canadians, don't you? I, you know what? It's uh, before I'd ever been here, which was a couple of years ago, you know, as Americans, I always joke about Canada, like, oh, Canadian. I don't know. It's kind of like a thing yeah. in our culture. And then I came here. Canadians are so nice and the men are so manly. The men are so manly and so Thank are the you. women. <laughs> no. It's just. Uh, so there's no know. competition. No, it's not that. I just, the guys are looking, the girls are nice. You guys have clean cities. Everyone's friendly. I went to a Tim Hortons. I don't know if I told, and I was, you guys have like a different way. Of, they have a coffee like their way at Tim Hortons. It's got their own menu. It's not a Starbucks. And I was trying to figure out what I wanted and I wasn't understanding something. And there's two old women behind me. And in America, I mean, this isn't a blanket statement, but you know, you'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in your way. I'll just move and they'd be like, great. And then they'd order. 
I felt that I was holding up the line and I was like, oh, I'll get out of the way. And they go, no, no, let's help you out here. Now, what did you want to order? And they like helped me through it. And I was like, that's so nice. Thank you. I think that was in like Edmonton or something. And you used to, or do you still date a Canadian? I do not. I have not dated a Canadian. Just the one though, I, we, uh, in years. And, he was uh, the best one though? He was the best and the only, yes. He was the best one. I'm trying to think <laughs> now. Aside from my close relationship. Last with, time you were here, you were dating him. That's right. how I knew that. So that was some time ago. Aside from my close relationship with Lori Gibbs. <laughs> oh, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not seeing any Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> she was just here last week. I love her. Yeah, so so not only so you've dated a Canadian guy. I did. You you uh, what's your other Canadian? You have a BlackBerry over iPhone. You oh, the RIM thing because it's based here. Rim. Isn't yeah, it a aren't they the company? ones that developed it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, BlackBerry. It's a Canadian company. Well, that's yeah. I was into it before I even knew it. There you go. It's my line. There was another uh, Canadian aspect to you, but I can't think what it was. Uh, let's think. I've got all these Canadian jokes are going through my head. I'm like, no, don't say you like maple syrup. <laughs> I don't think that, I think that's it. No, there was. I was just one. just for laughs. Maybe I wrote it down here. Let me Is see. That, you're, no, it wouldn't that's be something it? like that. Oh, because it's comic. Eastern Canada. Oh, okay. Um, no. <laughs> yeah, Calgary yuck yucks. Mm, I've no, it'll been come to, to me. Regina more than a regular person should. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we're we're here for you know a little while, so it'll come to me. I own Lululemon jackets. Took out a small loan for them, but Where I got them. Go? From Vancouver. It's a disgustingly expensive company. No <laughs> one needs that for sweating. No, not for sweating. No. But it's not for sweating. It's for looking good. Right, which I'm not into. Uh, if you can there help you it. Go. For working out, it's not for that. Now, it's nice to, uh, you've just wrapped up your second season of Excused. Mm -hmm. And you get made up pretty good on that show, don't you? you got a great makeup lady. Yeah. Do you, do you, but you seem like the type who prefers just to be casual and... and not made up all the time. I am that type, especially on stage. I've never been one to a lot of stand-up comedians that are girls wear dresses and go all out. I prefer not to do that because I'm a very casual t-shirt, jeans kind of person. But on TV, you know, they want to look. So I we negotiated. I was like, I'll do tank tops or like, let me pick the outfits. I didn't want to wear like E! News correspondent dresses all the time and be something I wasn't. And uh, I fight with my makeup woman on a daily basis. Like I always, I when every time she like puts a brush in my face, I always blow on it to get some of the powder off. Yeah, she's like, "We have to do this." I'm like, "You're a witch, no smoky eyes." So tell me about excused. I really don't want to hear more about my makeup. <laughs> That's not interesting. No, go on, go no. on. <laughs> what about excused? Uh, yeah, what about excused? Because it's a dating show now. For a while, I, I I'm a sucker for dating shows. Really, and they were all the rage. What 90s. five? It was it that long? Probably ago? late '90s because that's when they had Blind Date, and then there was Next, was and then date, there was and Greg Proops hosted one. Mm -hmm. There was all those. There was like uh, Eliminate. Yes, I all loved those. Eliminate. Those were all MTV shows, and uh, one of our producers actually, one of our CBS executives, did all those shows. The company that made Blind Date did Excuse, and so all those shows were huge in say late '90s, early 2000s, and then they kind of took a break. And I think we went more toward a serious take on dating, like The Bachelor, yes, stuff like that. And so well, this, I love The Bachelor too. It's its own thing for sure. Yeah. This show was kind of like a reintroduction to the comical side of dating, which we hadn't had on TV for at least 10 years. Um, and so our show kind of came first. And then there's a couple other shows that kind of came out about a year later from major networks. So I think ours was kind of like testing the waters and people liked it. And so we just shot the second season, which started airing, I think, last week. So, so a nice, relaxed shooting schedule. <laughs> a nice, relaxed shooting schedule of 100 episodes in a row, no breaks. <laughs> season uh, one. Only breaks. Who does 100 episodes in a season? I do. You do, yeah. And shows like Judge Judy and stuff, but their names are on the show. Season one was 130 episodes. Season two, they lightened the order for only 100. And we just finished it, and I'm just now returning to normalcy. Like, my brain is just unfrying itself. How do they get all these people per episode? A good casting department that yeah. works around the clock, going... But these are legitimate people looking for dates? Or are they actors who want to be on TV? <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's L.A., so you can probably figure it out. But a lot of them, you know, some people are actors. Not actors acting, but that's what they came to L.A. to do. But a lot of people have real jobs. We'll get lawyers, accountants, people in medical school, students that just wanted to be on a reality show or meet someone. And once in a while, you know, I don't keep up with them after the show because that would be weird. But uh, there are people that meet and date after. Really? So it's not... And I wonder what the percentage is. Um... What are you batting? Oof. <laughs> Through no fault of my own, I'd say we're, we're batting 
a good percentage. I don't know if I'm allowed to give numbers out. Okay. You do your best, though, to make it not work, though, don't you? You're pretty snarky. I'm snarky, but I'm on the side of the people I'm sitting with, and I'm only snarky to those that we're excusing. So if the contestants have decided that you're gone, it's just my job to see you off in style. Not my job to... If you like a girl, I'm not going to be like, she looks like a pig. She's got mm -hmm. awful teeth. Like, I would never... I do that off camera, yeah. but uh, I don't sway that they're voting either way. You can kind of tell when you see the four people sitting in the room, you can kind of tell right off the bat who's staying and who's going. And I always feel bad when there's like three good looking guys and one like nerdy guy. And, like unless he's got a great personality, which happens, you're like, oh, that sucks. Yeah. Have that impending sense of doom hanging but, over you. But he got his time on TV and that's all that matters. He got his 15 minutes and his, his cash. Yeah. And so uh, like how many of these people are just train wrecks? How many of them aren't? Oh, my God. We've had some incidences. We've had... Stuff that doesn't make it to air, obviously. Most of that stuff doesn't make it to air because like as risque time? as we want the show to be, it does air in middle America at like 2 p.m. in some places. Okay. So there's certain things we can't show, certain kisses you can't show. We've had people who come on set and they're determined to make it miserable from the second they get there and they're just assholes to production, to the producers, to the crew, to everyone. And what they don't get is that you can be as difficult as you want. It's not going to make it to air. And if you insult me and it's something like really rude, it's not going to make it to air. Unless you one up them. Right. But yeah. we, you know, you try to keep it. It's, a, it's supposed to be a lighthearted show. When people get really mean or nasty, you're only making it difficult on yourself. You're just making the day last longer. So your little character that you've created, we're going to edit out most of it. So people don't get that, you know, it's not helping you. To be difficult. Which we had to have a guy physically restrained last week. Really? Because he had too much to drink. He couldn't handle his alcohol, which is not an attractive quality. Like, know what you can drink. And he got laid out by the security guard. What was he trying to do? He was escorted off the... Okay, you want to know the truth? I was changing in my dressing room, and I looked out the window, and he was watching. Which I did not enjoy one bit. Ugh. That aside, I, like, I got upset, and they're like, well, obviously, I mean, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to shoot an episode one day. And you can't just send someone away without getting the footage you need because then mm -hmm. it's a whole day gone. So I'm like, all right, fine. He kept getting drunker and drunker throughout the day. And Who's feeding him the alcohol? It, you, you know, you, it's not, we give alcohol, but we don't know what it's interacting with. We don't know if you took right. something before, there's something wrong with you, or maybe five drinks and that's enough for you. You should know your limit. Yeah. You should know your limit. And we have limited the amount that we give people throughout the day. We're not like shoving alcohol down their mouths, but people steal drinks. Like, things happen, or you know, and um, and so he was excused, and he, excused, he was yeah. excused. He left, and because he was drunk and disorderly, that we asked him to wait in the parking lot with the security guard. We're like, you can't be, I didn't say this, the production, we're like, you're a threat to the crew, you're making everyone uncomfortable, you have to stay in the parking lot. And he chose to run past security to try to get back in the house for whatever reason. So security had to tackle him, because it's like, you shouldn't be running, you were asked to leave. These things happen, I think, with shooting any show. I think there was something on the X Factor last night. Someone like got arrested. I didn't want. I didn't see it. But uh, yeah, it's become such an industry, and, and people people see the you know like I'm thinking about the Bachelor. There's always some crazy person. Yeah, and they get the most TV time. So maybe right. people are watching these shows, going, Ah, I got to be a bit crazy or rude or whatever, and then I'll totally. get the TV time. What you don't get is that it's such it's so lightning in a bottle because there's so many assholes out there, so many crazy people. You have to be somewhat enjoyable to watch also our show is 18 minutes long so it isn't like you have a whole season to show off this character you have 18 minutes several of which those minutes you're not even on camera so the idea that your personality in one date which lasts about four minutes is really gonna make a difference it's not gonna happen no one ever got famous off of four minutes of tv from a syndicated dating show how long is the real date hours oh hours yeah it can be i mean sometimes you get in there they talk, they kiss, and then it's done. Once they've kissed, the date's pretty much over because that's usually the objective. Or if something interesting happens, sometimes we'll sit there for a while because the two are just not into each other and they made a bad decision and you're just sitting there like, oh, God, someone take off an artificial arm or do something. Um, but it's amazing what editors can put together, isn't it? It can be if you have the right editors. If not, yeah. it can be excruciating. But, yeah, I mean, and I've watched. I'm a fan of reality TV, so, you know, I watch and I see you say something and then they cut to a girl giving you a weird look. Like I know that that look wasn't intended for you, but it is amazing. Even when you suspend your disbelief, if you can suspend your disbelief and just go with it, it's amazing what they can put together for sure. 
why is your show only 18 minutes? Isn't it usually 22 it's for a, a half hour? Yeah, but so it's it's a half hour show and then it's 22 minutes, but it's actually like 18 minutes. I think ours is actually 18, not 22. Within the half hour, I think there's a lot more commercials on ours. How did you uh, land it? Did you audition? I hate that answer, but it is. I did audition. My manager sent me, this is probably two years ago, breakdown. She's like, there's an audition for a dating show. And I was like, I'm not going. I'm going to go take a nap. She's like, why don't you just go? Because it never hurts. Because you might audition. They might not like you, but then they bring you for something else. That happens all the time. So I went in and like any comic, I rewrote the audition. Because the lines that they, and they want you to do that. The lines were lame. And I was like, I could do this in my sleep. So I just started making up stuff and being funny. And they called me back. I didn't want to go to the callback. I did not want to do a dating show. And they're like, we want you. It'll be on every night, two times a day. You'll do 100 episodes. It'll be on, you'll be on TV every single day. So I said, okay. And we did it. And was it, the, um, was it a good choice? Yes. Did it make me famous? No. It is what it is. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. I think at the end of the day, what you take away from something like that is I could do any show now with my eyes closed. I did so many episodes. We're talking like Regis Philbin numbers. <laughs> that I mean, the work ethic was already there. And now it's like, there's nothing's ever going to be as hard as that. Yeah, there's no real bad job because now people will see that you're capable of doing that. Ideally. And it could lead to something else. Ideally. I mean, but why didn't you want to do it when you're such a fan of reality TV? I think dating. I think the, the idea of a dating show, it just sounds cheesy, like the dating game or something, you know? And I would not have taken the job except they were so gung ho about letting me make it my own. Now, very few comics take gigs. I mean, it's produced by CBS, so this isn't like some like random network that you only get on like a special cable channel. Mm -hmm. They were they're like what everything that I say I just make up. And they're really cool about that. And they let me kind of guide the comedy when I'm on camera. How the dates go is totally on the story producers, but I'm very fortunate. Most comics have to read off a teleprompter or something and they've they're very big on letting me be funny and be me. And I think as the episodes went on, they were able to edit and tailor the show to that. So I'm happy about that. What about your dating life? What about it? Not as funny as excused. My dating yeah, life is excused. You, have you had those uh, just train wreck dates? No, I wish. I'm not one of these embittered female comics that's like, I can't get a good date, and hey, this guy made me pay, and it was awful. I, I've had a pretty good track record. I actually don't date a lot. I tend to just find myself in these long-term relationships. It starts out with a date. Starts out with a date, ends with a fight. I had a boyfriend for about a year, and we broke up about f four or six months ago, and I've just been... Are you a tough girlfriend? I think I'm a very... I'm a, I don't think any girl would be like, yeah, I'm difficult. I think I'm very easygoing in a relationship because part of my act is observing annoying behaviors of girls. So I kind of, on a daily basis, relearn what not to do. I think men are very simple in that they really require three things. They need food, they need sex, and they need to not be nagged. If you can do that, I mean, obviously there's complexities that lie within every relationship, but for the most part, I don't know. I think, um, I think people get into relationships for a lot of the wrong reasons. And the more I see couples, the more grossed out I get. Really? Most, just like, annoy, like you, I have one friend who's in a relationship and they've been dating forever and everything with them is like, they're always going to boring places and have boring agendas. You ever, you ever said like, you look at like a couple and it's just like, Oh, this weekend we're going to go meet Steve's parents um, in Burbank. That doesn't mean anything to you, but like... Yeah, sure it does. I've been to Burbank. Some awful suburb. We're going to spend the week, and I'm like... <sighs> like, Steve's parents sound awful. Yeah, you sound like the ideal girlfriend. I, <laughs> I just... If you need me to go with you so, to something, fine, but let's... <laughs> Eliza, are you guys going to get drunk wait, or something? When you're, when you're in this relationship for a year, are you saying that you never do anything that other people would look at and go, really? Uh dull, boring. I don't but it's know. not because you're in the middle of it. I think also like being a comedian, it's different because you have such a exotic job to some, you know, and mm -hmm. I just don't require much. I mean, if you're my boyfriend, I'm going to ask that once in a while you sit while I go on Pinterest and I plan a fake party that we're never going to have. And I like you to come to the farmer's market with me, which is actually an excruciating task because it's usually so effing hot outside. Aside from that, I'm very content to just kind of like putter around my house and like live in a fantasy world that doesn't exist. But you're, you're correct me if I'm wrong. Head Gorgeous. Oh, headstrong, I, I, opinionated, I, mm -hmm. uh, driven. Yeah. So as long as you don't fuck with that, <laughs> then we'll be fine. So, so you yeah. stay out of my way. We'll you be know fine. the rules. 
I, I tend to date guys who, you know, I, I want you to have your own thing, but I don't, I tend to date very mellow guys. I think you have to be mellow with me and I think it just works out that way. My ex-boyfriend, there were definitely times where I'd be freaking out about something. There's one time he was a large guy. I was getting very upset about something ridiculous. I, I mean, we never had like a real fight and he physically picked me up and put me outside of the room and shut the door. He was like, I can't talk to you right now. And I was like, that's fine. I'll just be in the kitchen. I don't know. I, I get really creeped out by girls that are super needy. Like I like the idea of a boyfriend, but you should be a complete person. And then you find someone that compliments you. Right. None of this Romeo and Juliet. I can't breathe without you. That comes later, but let you get a job, get a life. Doesn't don't be a gold digger. Fine. I don't know anything about relationships. Only <laughs> and had you're it. the host of a dating show. Uh, no one said these people are in relationships. But yeah. and, and and so you mentioned this guy who was looking in your window. I don't know why you were undressing with a window. I'll tell you why. Because everyone's going to say that. Here's why. And this is boring, but you have to listen to it. Okay. My dressing room is on a ba- it's in a house. The whole show is shot in a, like this mansion. Oh yeah, yeah. My dressing room is on a balcony, but that balcony. You can't see in it or anything. Next to my dressing room is an is another room that they use as an office. And the PA made a mistake of letting the daters stand in that office like while they were waiting for something. And he wandered out onto the balcony. No one ever goes out there. So it's because they hadn't been corralled properly. And he was out there. In 100, in 230 episodes, no one's ever done that. I see. So by last week, that was like not something on my mind. I was in my underwear. I wasn't naked. But it was just kind of like a creepy feeling. Yeah. And my first thought was, you're welcome. But then I was like, no, I wasn't even like cute underwear. And then I was like, did I look fat? Is he going to tell people I look fat? What was I doing? So he's dead now. <laughs> uh, now, have any of the contestants coming on the show? Because we, we know they're not all there to, to find a date. Yes, they are. Uh, but have That they, statement courtesy of CBS. Have they, have they ever tried to ask you out or have they asked you out have you gone out with any of them? no no that would be completely inappropriate i'm also extremely shallow so i think there's been maybe two guys on the show in both seasons that i've found like drop dead gorgeous yeah aside from that i'm just and did they reciprocate like were they hitting on you they might have been i'm very i'm blissfully unaware of when that's happening for someone that does this for a living i'm just i always assume people are joking or guys are just yeah i mean Every guy has their flirting technique. Some guys try to be rude. Some guys try to be funny. If you're trying to be funny and you're not, there's no bigger turnoff on the planet. You know, you find yourself going back and forth a lot. And to me, like you know when you play with your dog and the dog gets like overly excited and you're like, take it easy, I was just playing? I'm that dog, like, which is a horrible thing to say. Like if a guy, we're going back and forth, I'm like, oh, a challenge. Let's see who's going to win this. I don't realize that he's just like being playful. Right. I'm like, let's take this to the death. Let's do this. Yeah. Um, Settle down. Settle down. Lady. Yeah, they're not a... Uh, you know, you have guys and they ask you questions. And quite frankly, I'm not a celebrity, but call me like an but R-list celebrity. you play celebrity. one on TV. I do play one on TV. It's a little uncomfortable because you're there to kind of chaperone these people through the annals of love. But when you're just sitting there, they feel a connection with you because you've been making them laugh all day. It does get a little uncomfortable because then they start asking you personal questions. And unless you have a podcast and a microphone... I don't like to be asked questions. I don't think anyone wants that. You're a total stranger and you're asking me, where are you from? Do you have a boyfriend? Like it's kind of, you have to kind of draw a line. So I, I do my best to be personable without being off-putting. Right. You put up the wall. You try. Yeah. And you peer over it. I peer over it if you're hot enough. No. But I, it's just, uh, it's no one's business. So, so the young Eliza Schlesinger. Very young. Watch out. The younger like uh-huh. high school age. Oh, okay. We're talking about something else. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. What? Uh, yeah. You're still. You're still young. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, what was that? What were you like then? I don't know. Like, probably the same. Yeah. Probably a little less jaded, but it was always funny. Dating I mean, a lot. I was. I always had boyfriends. Not like super popular, but for three out of the four years of high school, I had a boyfriend for the whole year. Part of that's the, a lie. Two. Two of the four. Part of the in crowd. It's a again. It's an unrelatable thing for me because I went to a small private school. There's only 100 kids in my grade. So I was on the cooler side, but I wasn't all like... All-girls school? No. But I wasn't one of like those like hot girls that like every, all the upperclassmen want. Like I was fun. I was a class clown. Friends with the popular kids, but not the first girl you'd call if you were going to have like a party, you know? But I was friends with them and we're still, you know... I was, I guess, popular enough. I def- I had a girl that was in my grade. and we A lot of us had known each other since we were in like kindergarten. So it's not like a typical high school, but I had a girl that 
I had, I had really never, I was never rude to anyone. I'm just, I'm not like that, but I think I had, I had offended her somehow and she came to a show and she was like, I hated you in high school. And I'm taking it as a compliment because I'm like, I was popular enough that you hated me. And I was like, I, I'm so sorry. I I'd, I'd never talked to you. She's like, exactly. I'm like, but we weren't even like, Yeah. it wasn't like out of ignore. What do you, you want from me? Everybody? Right. Yeah, it was so odd. So I apologized if I made her feel bad. And then she was, a year later, she came to my show again. She's like, I was drunk. I shouldn't have said that. And I'm like, no wonder I didn't talk to you. You're awful. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> but yeah, not, not, po- not popular enough that I... You should, everyone should be a little unpopular for a while so they can be better in society. There, there's a belief among some that uh, comics should sort of be in the fringes of society. They are. I've not the popular kids, not the, not the good-looking people. Right. Well, and what do you do? You, do you get backlash at all? Do you hear any of it? I'm sure I do. You know, well, you're too pretty to be a comic. Look, what what is irritating about that is, am I more attractive than almost every comic? Yes. Am I more attractive than almost every actor? Not by a long shot. So in a comedy club, you're so hot. In an audition, oh, you're a quirky neighbor. And in real life, oh, there's a cute girl. So it's a weird sliding scale. But you kind of have to adapt to you can you know you and all you can do is be like this is what people think of me and and that's the way it is I, I I'm not a supermodel and I don't play up my looks because I don't consider myself like a hot girl and this isn't like when you interview a swimsuit model and she's like I'm just an average girl like no I'm not funny because of my looks but I'm not funny in spite of them that's right but 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 don't you I'm not wrong in saying that there's a perception out there among some yeah. that think, eh, what are you doing up there? Maybe. I think you can think that, but I think once you see the act, yeah, that all goes away. When I first started comedy, I would walk out. This was before Last Comic Standing. I'd walk on stage and I'd be like, how are you guys doing? Is everyone having a good time? And I would talk like that for like 45 seconds until I got the audience silent and miserable. And then I would say, I'm just kidding. I don't actually talk like that. And then there was a sense of relief. So I think... Your looks give you, for those who don't know you, and hopefully I've been doing comedy long enough that if you're coming to the show, you know who I am. Um, Like you're deliberately coming versus being duped by a friend. That is a bit of a hurdle when you first walk on stage. Even now, that's why I don't really dress up and it bothers people. Why would you put another hurdle between you and the audience? They've already got to adjust the fact that you're a girl and that you're not hideous and that you have blonde hair. Why would you wear something revealing so that they're staring at your body the whole time? Like, I very much want you to listen to my words because I take great pride in them. If I was up there just telling cock jokes, then, yeah, I, too, would wear a slutty dress and it wouldn't really matter. I also don't dress like that in real life. It's just, it's an issue that gets brought up a lot, and I just, you're there to make people listen to you, yeah. not to do a fashion show. You're also uh, on stage, I wouldn't say physical, but you... I would say physical. Yeah? I move around yeah, yeah. more than probably yeah, any animated. other girl. I'm thinking animated, and, and uh, you really sell your material now when you started out were you that way or were you just standing behind a mic sort of telling jokes i think when i first started and there's and i can't get rid of them, there's like three videos out there i don't have a lot of videos online of stand-up because i prefer to not do that because then you're kind of wasting material of me just standing there but the more i got comfortable with it and it was especially after last comic it was such a huge stage and it's such colorful material that it kind of lends itself to moving around more and i when i'm thinking aloud at home or when i'm working something out i pace anyway and a lot of the jokes were just physical jokes, and I think there's a lot of humor to be found in the human body, and that's just, it kind of evolved into that. I got, I mean, I, I stopped doing some of the jokes that are physical, but there's still a lot of moving and kicking, and it just kind of comes out naturally. I've been told that I lunge a lot when I'm on stage. Yes, <laughs> now that you mention it. I don't even realize it, and it's just a very comfortable resting pose for me. Yeah, you're doing your stretches while you're I up I think there. so. I think I came by honestly, but I'm more comfortable getting in like some sort of squatting pose and talking than I am doing the alt comic stand still hold a mic really close thing. Checking your notes. Checking my notes. Oh, that's not funny. Oh, this is. <laughs> I hate when they. I hate when any comic brings a notebook. You can bring a notebook on stage. That's fine. Piece of paper, whatever. Because the art is the joke telling, not the memorization. But we pick up the like as if it's an honor to listen to your shitty jokes about space time. And people pick it up and they're like, "What's funny? Am I going to read that? No, that's not. It's just like." We don't need the process of decision making. Just tell us the jokes. You're a professional. Professional. Have something. Read off of it, but don't tell me you're reading off of it. Last time we spoke, you sounded like you had a bit of a axe to grind with the alt scene. Yeah. Have yeah. you heard Bill Burr's rant on this? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote him a love note after that. Yeah. I saw him. I was like, did you see my email? Well, explain it for those that haven't heard it. It was just talking. I mean, it was so long ago. But basically the idea that. Not that long ago. All com- well, I didn't really pay that much. I read it once and then that was that. Yeah. All comics get all this credit. They're so amazing. But his whole thing was alt comic go first and the mainstream comics got to pick up after him. A mainstream comic can play anywhere. An alt comic can only play in specific venues. I think the whole division of the two is just absolute bullshit. And the whole reason, for those of you that don't know, I'll give you a bit of a lesson. The whole term alternative comic, which came about, we'll say like early 90s, Janine Garofalo, Ben Stiller, all these people, they were called alternative comics because they couldn't book work in regular clubs. So they would perform in alternative venues. And also, to be fair, they didn't also like the expectations in those clubs. Okay. Fine. But they weren't working there. So they would go to alternative venues for whatever reason. Laundromat, comic book store, restaurant, whatever. And it became its own thing. So it's kind of like this counterculture. Like, no, we're all... And now, alternative comics work in comedy clubs and have TV shows and movie deal. Patton Oswalt, your favorite alternative comic ever, who I love, by the way, He's got millions and millions of dollars. He did a cartoon, for God's sakes. This is nothing against him. I'm just saying. So people label themselves alternative comic. I think now it's become more of a way that you present yourself and look. There's really, when I look at alt comics, I mean, I can hold my own in an alternative room. I love doing them. It isn't like what you're saying is so fucking brilliant that a mainstream comic can't hang. And I promise you, it's not about intelligence. I've gotten up there and I can wax poetic about any sort of theory on mankind or shoestring theory in correlation with what kind of converse you're wearing, whatever. It really, it's more of an attitude and stuff like that. It's almost more conversational too, rather than performance. Maybe. It's less, I mean, less set up punch, you know, but for that, I could be an alternative comic because I go on rants and I talk to the audience. It's not, you know, set up punch BJ joke. Yeah, it's a really blurred line. Yeah, I think it's kind of like the term hippie. Like once at the 60s and 70s, everyone knew exactly what a hippie was. And now if you're a hippie, you can still have a corporate job but drive a Prius and only use recycled materials. Yeah. So it's just kind of changed through time. It's not what it was one, once was. And so I wear my mainstream comic badge with pride because I work. Do you, do you have close friends in comedy? Mm-hmm. Who are your peeps? I don't really have any famous friends. Well, I mean, hey. People who listen to this are comedy nerds. We know. I'm from, I cut my teeth at the comedy store and the improv and the laugh factory, but mostly the comedy store. So we got a lot of comics that come out of Brian Cowan, who I was telling you earlier. I mean, we don't like hang out, but we're friendly and I think he's great. I think Dove Davidoff's great. I think Brett Ernst is great. There's a comic named Jody Miller out of LA. She's my best friend. She's been to Canada with me a couple of times. She's great. Lori Gibbs. We became quite close. There's no, I don't think there's any comics that I don't get along with. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's so hard. Like, I really enjoy watching. We're not friends, but Pablo Francisco, I think he's great. Sebastian, he's a comic out of L.A. I always say the same people, but these are all store comics. So I get a chance to watch them more than anyone else because for the last five years, I'm there almost every night. So who else are you going to see, you know? I think Joe Rogan's a great example of someone who, there's a guy who, he's a good-looking guy. He's like a tough guy. He's just as smart as anyone else out there. And so I think, I think when people look at alternative versus mainstream, it's like, oh, if you're good looking, you can't be funny. And it's like, well, he is. And, I, and he's got a great podcast. Um, I saw you on it. I've been on it. And he's great. And uh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's very smart, but he also believes in a lot of crazy. He's crazy. He's out of his fucking mind. <laughs> but, sorry. but, you know, he puts it out there and he can substantiate whatever thoughts he has with facts or theories. Facts in air quotes. Yes. Yeah, well, if you, it's on the internet, it's true. You mentioned... Uh, <laughs> Just in passing, I don't know. You've been on his show a couple times? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this was an earlier one. Uh, and you just mentioned in passing. Now, I was curious about it. How Uh-oh. You, Uh-oh. you were talking to friends, and you were in the process, you said, of defriending a friend in real life. I wonder who that was. Well, I wasn't interested so much in who, but just like you and your friends getting together. How are we going to get her out of oh. the group? Uh, <laughs> wasn't in our group. It was a... I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. We are no longer friends. It was, she had done something. It's not even a group. It was just three of us. What's the point? What do you want to do? I don't know. I'm just wondering if about she's the alive process. Now? Like, no, 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 of telling her. Like, I didn't. I just stopped calling. And okay. The good news it's, is she's so shady that she was never calling me in the first place to be like, what happened? I think she got that she had done something very, very bad. 
and my one friend is the one that they live in the same city. And so for her, it was more of a thing. For me, it was like, I'm just not going to text you anymore. And I, once in a while we text, but, you know, you don't live in the same city and one of you is batshit crazy. It kind of puts a strain on a relationship and you don't, nothing ventured, nothing gained, I guess. Where's your forgiveness, Eliza? I have forgiveness. I actually don't. I have no mercy for those who can't figure their shit out. Yeah, I mean, you give them some leeway and then after a certain amount of time, it's like, hey, really, it's too much energy. Whether in friendship or love or in society, you're given a certain amount of chances and if I have my crap together and you can't figure it out, then perhaps it just wasn't meant to be. I think I live, we live in a society where assholes are just given chances, whether it's in entertainment or America in general or this me generation. People are just given chances. And as an adult, you have a choice. You don't have to be friends with everyone. You don't have to be rude to anyone. But, you know, I was never super popular in high school, and I don't subscribe to this whole mentality of, like, stay friends with everyone, even if they're annoying. Like, you make a choice. If someone starts to let you down, you can either decide this is how they are and have lower expectations or you cut them off. You don't want to be a dick about it, but if someone's making you unhappy, what's the incentive to keep them in your life? You're a thinker. I'm a very heavy thinker. <laughs> I'm a doer. But you are, uh, like, you have, you have strong opinions. You have theories. Oh, I got theories. We, we were at lunch <laughs> earlier, and you uh-huh. came up with, like, just three were like they good? I got a theory. I can't remember what they were now, but I remember <laughs> thinking, well, you got a lot of theories. Got some theories, and but I could be swayed another direction. If you gave me some a valid argument, I could... That's good. You're open. Super open. Yeah. Because even as I'm talking, I'm like, are you really putting the sentence together? I wouldn't trust me. That's one thing I've learned recently is that I cannot be trusted. Especially as a woman. We have hormones and chemicals, and there are... T- like, you, every woman has a time of the month, and there's like a week before that where you cannot rely on your own emotions and you're sitting there crying and you're like, well, why am I upset? And your brain's telling you that you're legitimately upset, but you know somewhere in there that there's no reason to be upset right now. So I can't be trusted. My emotions can't be relied upon. It ta- I have At to least uh, for one week of the month. But then the rest of them are questionable also. Sometimes I'll think that like everyone is ganging up on me and hates me, but the truth is no one's even thinking about me. I think everyone has that. I've had times where I walk into a room and I'm convinced no one likes me. For no reason. I mean, like, I doubt yeah. there's no truth to that, but I think we all do that. Out of insecurities, you decide things ahead of time, and it becomes such a truth to you that you can't let that go, and you find comfort in that false truth. I want to ask you on behalf of men. For, for yes, that, they're real. For that no. week, <laughs> for, <laughs> for that week where you say you can't trust your emotions. Yeah. <laughs> you you're aware of the reason behind that, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But you magnets, can't, magnets in your brain. No, uh, but you can't. Uh, it's you. I can't. You can't stop projecting that on everyone around you. There, that's the difference, and I refuse to do that. You might be like, I'll be a bit more irritable, yeah. but I don't ever take it out on anyone. I'm a huge right. advocate for regulating yourself or just being. Look, I'm in a bad mood. I'm going to go. I'm just snapping. It's very. It's your reality, so it's very difficult to be like, I'm just being a little crazy because no one wants to admit that they're. PMS, you're crazy. You'd like to think you're in control all the time. But if you, if you said, look, I'm in a bad mood, I'm going to go, that in some way projects it onto the person who's standing there innocently. That's on them. That's on them? I said, I'm in a bad mood, I'm going to go. That's me. But I can't change it? I can't put you in a good you mood? You might be able to. You risk do that, you risk getting your head bitten off. <laughs> there you go. You try. <laughs> Anywhere else we want to go with that? With the PMS? No, I'm good. But I was just really warning you. Yeah, women. Yeah, women comics. That's all they talk about. You know what? I've never made a PMS joke, nor would I, because it even grosses me out. The thought of it, all yeah. of it. I still get weird about buying tampons. I'm like, I'll take this and a pack of gum, and also a pack of Magnums. I do. You know, I, I do. I'm very proud of it. I mean, whenever I walk in, and if anyone gives me a look, I'll be like, "What? It's the responsibility of having a reproductive system. Check out, please. <laughs> Don't fuck with me. Don't fuck with me. Uh-huh. Oh God, if someone actually did, I wouldn't know what to do. I couldn't defend myself physically. Bark is bigger than my bite. Yeah, but your bark's pretty big. Got pretty big bark, so hopefully you stay away. But if it actually came to blows, first of all, I would not engage. I'd be like, who fights? That's so trashy. Or I would go like ape shit crazy and rip off someone's face. Have you ever been in a physical fight? No. No. I'm educated. I went to private school. I don't fight. Good. Ridiculous. Good for you. <laughs> and you can control your alcohol intake. No. No. But you know, hopefully you're with people. I definitely get a little combative when I'm drunk or it depends on who you're with and what you're doing. 
last, what happened the other night? We went out drinking and I had to, this is, I shouldn't be revealing this, but I think it was funny. This is just an example of how crazy girls can be. We were out drinking and I, no guy would talk to me all night. No one would talk to me. And I decided that no man was ever going to talk to me again. So I just left the bar and I went and waited in the car. <laughs> so you you say no man would talk to you. Did you try or you I were just I shouldn't have to try. There? I know you shouldn't. But it's weird. As a girl, I believe the guy should talk to you. If the girl's the aggressor, then it's almost like, well, what else would she do? I was sitting there. No one would talk to me. And I was like, fuck this. I went. I waited in the car. We had a car that night. And I just sat there and I texted my friends. I'm like, I'm leaving in five if you don't get here. And then I made the car go through the drive through line so I could get chicken. <laughs> Did you take it the next, the next step and wonder why they weren't talking to you? It wasn't just well, because was, they don't like you. It must, it must have been that. They don't like me and my face. No, um, it's probably that you're too intimidating. Yes, that was starting to bother me too. Like, so I'm going to go, I'm so, I, I just failed to believe that I'm so intimidating. I'm not some like Amazon supermodel. Um, it was a very tight dress, so maybe. But grow a pair. What happened to guys that have like confidence? I get rejected for a living, both in auditions and on stage. And you can't handle a girl being like, thanks. What is, what is that? You guys go to war and you you fight for fun and you you do these things and you can't reject one girl in a pink dress saying, no, I'm good. Give me a break. So what do you expect when a guy comes up and talks to you? I expect you to be hot and take your shirt off. <laughs> what? <laughs> what, if he, what if he's not hot and Whoa, he just It's going to be a long road. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, a guy <laughs> so you want to be approached and asked out. No, not something. just, but to, you, know, you don't have to be cheesy about it, but just... Talk, say say anything. So as as you are insecure, saying you're not a supermodel, these guys might be insecure, going, ah, she's too hot for me. But even good, though stay the, away. Even though that. they may think that, oh, so you like these sort of bravado guy? No, I just tough guy. The Joe Rogans of the world. Here's my thing. Here's my thing. Um, and a guy friend of mine said this once, and I thought it was a very good point because girls put a lot of emphasis on it's about your personality and what's on the inside, and you're a thousand percent right. And my friend said you cannot. However. You cannot check out a personality from across the room. Yeah. The immediate attraction, especially in a bar scene, and granted, you're not going to meet your future spouse at a bar for the most part. Well, Canadians seem to like bars. I don't know. The immediate attraction has to be there, and then the personality is what seals the deal. And actually, the show that I host, that's kind of their motto, I guess. Your first impression gets you in the door. Second impression keeps you there. You can be good looking, and if you're a douche, which I'm going to figure out in a couple minutes, we're done here. And you could be not attractive and have the best personality ever, but in a high pressure scene like a bar or where you're out and you're drinking you got to be firing on all cylinders you got to come with something that's going to make somebody want to stop and get to know you that's why girls dress up otherwise we would go meet guys at a library that's why animals have bright colors to attract people and then everything else takes over that's what heels are for you are a thinker it's just i mean that's all there is to it no one's ever checked out the girl with the glasses and the sweater been like i want to get to know her some guys are maybe but uh, I don't know. Guys are shallow. With, and people are always shocked that I can be shallow. I mean, just like someone that's attractive. Or I've definitely been attracted to guys who well, aren't hot. There you go. And it's because it's, attractive is so subjective. It's not necessarily objectively attractive that everyone would go, that's right. an attractive guy. Except for supermodels. <laughs> right. It's somebody who you are attracted to. There have been, in comedy, there have, have been have guys. You have to be attracted to the person that you're with. Yes. Yeah. Now, I like a tough, I'll say all American, you could be all Canadian, whatever, a tough, huge, muscular guy. But on the other end of that scale, I've been attracted to some very, of slight build, nerdy guys. Like the kind of attractive where you're like, I can't eat because I think you're so hot. And they're not winning any good-looking prizes. Yeah, but what do they do for a living? Doesn't matter. Uh, really? They're smart for a living. We'll put it that way. But that plays a factor, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. If right? you're an idiot, it can't happen. But not even a, a you know, if, if, if you like them and they're intelligent, but they happen to work at the library or something, right? But, but there's something... Uh, there's a cachet to, hey, well, he's a producer or he's a... Oh, they weren't. It wasn't like that. No, no, okay. but not like that. But just somebody who has a cool kind of It's not even job. so much the, if someone had that. It's a... I hate... Oh, I'm trying to think of it. Like, bravado is a word that you said. You know, if you're a producer or something, if you are... If you're comfortable with what you do and you're confident, which is huge, and you have some sort of drive, I can't be with someone that's like, I'm just going to be a clerk here at the Verizon store for my whole life. You have to have drive and confidence and... You can learn to be attracted to someone, but I'm saying like in an instant, you know, I prefer really hot guys, but if you're smart and funny and you don't have a gross body, we can make that work too. 
if their drive is to work at the Verizon store. That's not, that's not, that's reverse. That's not drive. <laughs> okay. uh, Liza, what else did I have here for you? Oh, um, tonight there's a premiere in town of a documentary that you were in. Oh, alone yes. Up there. That is tonight. I saw it. I I'm saw in it for like uh, 30 seconds. No, I you're think. in it for longer. Oh, really? Maybe I just you're, saw the trailer. <laughs> you're on throughout. Yeah, that's okay. right. <laughs> and uh, it's called Alone Up There, and many comedians are in it, and you were there. Like, how did this even come about? Because you're in, getting your toes done. I forgot that we had an interview. And so you said, oh, I'll and be here. And they called me, and I was like, I'm getting a pedicure. And Show so they up. came. <laughs> I felt bad about that. I was just wondering about the woman sitting at the... The next chair over. No, she didn't speak English. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, but yes, so I saw it, and uh, it was good. You were you were in it. Oh, I'm glad. I wish I could see it tonight. Yeah, there used to be this thing where people say, ah, you can't talk about comedy because it just kills it. Right. But, you know, with the advent of podcasts and, and comedy so huge now, and, and this film is full of comedians doing precisely that, talking about the process of comedy. Yeah, you guys love to talk about it, right? Talk shop. It's what we know, yeah. but also what we don't know. You don't really know why you're funny. You can have theories and you can have experiences that have led to that, but you know, you don't know if it's nature versus nurture. I personally think you're born with it, and then it's sort of nurtured. If you're a family of all rocket scientists, you might be born an inclination of being funny, but if you're just taught to be a rocket scientist, perhaps you don't fully realize You'll that. You'll be the funny rocket scientist. Yeah, so it's something that we can talk about because th no one's wrong. No one's right, I guess. I mean, I'm sure we could find someone that's wrong, and uh, I guess everyone's opinion's valid. If you're a, if you if you consider yourself a comic, then your opinion counts. Right, and, and every rule that you make about comedy, or not you, anybody makes right. about it, you're gonna find a million exceptions. Sure, it, like right? women aren't funny. Well, I disagree. Well, well yeah. Who who was it who said that recently? Recently, I don't know. Uh, uh, oh, the Booker of name? the Tonight Show, or the no. not that what. The guy, Jimmy Kimmel's buddy, Adam Carolla. I've been on his podcast several times. I don't disagree. I do think a lot of women are not funny. I do think a lot of women rely on this whole, like, I'll be filthy, and then it'll be shocking when I do. And there are women that do that well, and then there are the imitators. But there are funny women out there, and that's just ridiculous. I mean, there are more men who are not funny than there are women, because there's more men that do comedy. That's right. Um, and that's what's, that's what's missing when you single out women for saying women ridiculous. are ridiculous. There are a lot of unfunny female stand-ups for sure. There's a ton more unfunny male stand-ups. You can't tell me that like Kristen Wiig isn't funny. You can't tell me Tina Fey isn't a brilliant Well, writer. they're not stand-ups, though. No, but they're still in the business of being funny. True, true. You can't true, tell me yeah, Ellen's yeah. not funny. Yeah. You can tell me Paula Poundstone isn't funny, but I won't believe you. Right. So, and the list goes on and on. Not for long, <laughs> but it does go on. <laughs> <laughs> so, fine. It's fine if people want to believe that. Lori Gibbs. Mm. Excuse me. That should have been at the top of the list. Wow, and you just, when did you meet her? Two years ago, maybe? She came right up to me. A lot of comics are dicks. I've had comics, I'll do a weekend with someone and they won't talk to me. And it's always a guy that's got like some ax to grind because he's not the headliner, whatever. Lori came up to me. I did a guest spot at a Yuck Yucks in Calgary, at the Yuck Yucks in Calgary. She was like, oh my God, I'm Lori. Watch your own last comic standing. I want to be your best friend. And I was just like, that's so nice. And it wasn't like a Hollywood thing. It wasn't like, I didn't feel like she was just trying to be friends with me for whatever reason. And we talk all the time. Just, I wish more people were like that. Mm -hmm. Actually, a lot of people like that, but you think they're creepy. But there was a, she was genuine. You mentioned Last Comic Standing. We talked about that last time you were here. But it, it's nice now with Excused, you're not just the girl that won Last Comic Standing. I still am. You Even are. on the flyer for this show, it doesn't say Excused. And I think that, oh, you know, that's right. I could be frustrated, but the truth is it's the biggest thing I've done. And that is... No one's fault but my own. And uh, Fault? Yeah, I'll use the word fault. You know, you do things on a, we'll say global scale, but on a North American scale, that's a major network show. So that's going to stick out more than the fact that I've had a half hour special on Comedy Central or just a John Oliver or I'm putting out an hour. Like these are big deals, but it's on, it's on a cable network that you guys don't even have here or that if you're a fan of comedy, you might know it. But that was on just such a, gr a large stage and greater platform that more people are going to know about it. Um, and people love competitions. People love competitions. Excused, is, it's a hu it was a huge undertaking, and I did it. And it's just not as, and I'm okay with this, it's a syndicated show. They're not built to be these like huge hits right out of the gate. They take time to build. And um, 
comes with the territory. And in the meantime, I can cry into my residual checks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is what it is. But yeah, you don't regret Last Comic Stand. No. No. Anyone that has anything bad to say about that show, they're just bitter because they didn't win. That's really all there is to it. And there's a lot of bitter comics. Yeah. You can take whatever you want away. I know all of the other winners. I, I don't know Dat Fan, but Who's I know. Who's the best winner? Me. In your opinion. Me. The, the best comic. The one that you enjoy the most. No, I really enjoy John Reap's act. I really love John Heffron. He's so funny. Alonzo Bowden, to me, is so smart. So funny. His po- he's making these points. It's rare when you get a comic, you're like, that's a good point, and I'm laughing. Mm-hmm. I really it's like usually him. usually one or the other. Yeah. Or it's so that's irreverent or ridiculous, but he's, it's, he's not goofy or wacky, which I kind of enjoy. I like John Reap for like the, this, all the stuff about um, like his hometown and stuff like that. And John Heffron's just, he's so funny. So I like all of them. We all get along. And there's no, when I, meet, when I hang out with those guys, there's no anger. There's no bitterness. There's no nothing. And you see that with a lot all of winners. that, but even successful comics in general, they are crazy and probably bitter in some regards. But when it comes to comics, they're not, it's the ones that feel unfulfilled as performers that have issues with everyone. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, like Mark Marin, for years, he was known as the guy and listening to his podcast, he, he fully admits it, right. how he, you know, had nothing good to say about most other right. comics, but now that he's reached this level of success, he's much more generous and yep. open, and uh, yeah, I guess more just happy with himself. Well, I think it's a, a complicated issue because I had a conversation with someone. I'm not going to say the name. A very, very, very famous person recently, and we were having a disagreement, and I was expressing some discontent with where I was in my career or whatever. And he was like, just let, I mean, it's cool. Just enjoy everything. And this guy is one of the more famous people on the planet. And I, rather than listen, I, I had some wine in me. But I also was like, I'm really sick of people that have made a lot of money and or really famous telling those on their way up to be content. Because I highly doubt you would have given yourself that advice 15 years ago. Anybody that's goal-oriented and that has a dream and that is struggling, you're going to be, you're not going to rest on your laurels for long. And so... If you're a rock star or a movie star or something and you're like, oh, yeah, everything's great. But it wasn't so great when you were waiting tables going to open auditions. It was Watching everyone else rise yes. above you. Now, it's not a co- I mean, it, you say it's not a competition, but it kind of is. And you have to learn, which I'm trying to do, to separate yourself from others and others' achievements because you can always, you'll probably have more than most. But it's okay to not be thrilled with where you are and to keep trying. You can't take it out on other people, which a lot of comics do. And that's how you can, I don't know, there's some poison in that, I think. But there's the more successful comics do tend to be the happier ones, and that's because money and success make you happy. Or do you think some of these more successful comics just had that to begin with, and that's what made them more successful? They just had this inner peace, this no. just accepting. No. Inner peace comes we're buying meditation tapes and going on retreats to Canyon Ranch. That's how you get inner peace. I think it's something that you learn to... You do get the piss beaten out of you in this industry. I look at where I was a couple years ago even who I was before last comic, and you go through these phases of anxiety and contentment and anger, and, you know, eventually you kind of, you don't lose your drive, but I don't have the energy to be angry or to keep up with other comics and keep tabs because it truly doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. As long as you're making a living. Yeah, but as long as I'm happy. I would be happy. My biggest thing is being happy. Money always follows. For me, it really, I mean... I didn't even care about how much money you could make from doing the dating show. I didn't even know there was a cash prize for Last Comic Standing. You do these things to reach certain platforms in your career so that you have the opportunity to do to work and do what you want to do so that you're not beholden to uh, a meeting in a writer's room so that you don't have to write a script for someone else. You make these sacrifices and you take shitty gigs and you learn these lessons so that at some point you can stop if you want to, rest if you want to, and take a gig that you like. The journey is an end unto itself. Yes, as frustrating as it is, because you wish someone would guarantee you that there was a good end to the journey, but at the end of the day, it has to be about the journey, otherwise I guess you have nothing. I'm really trying to make myself believe that. that I host a dating show. Oh, no. I'm getting there. It's okay. It could be worse. It's good. That's the job. It's over now. Now it's good. It's over? And, well, uh, the, yeah. And you're headlining clubs all over the place? Yeah. I really like traveling. That sounded like I was crying. I was burping. Um, 
Yeah, and I apologize for making you sit inside doing a podcast on a, such a nice day. Normally, what what do you do when you go to town? I would have been sleeping. Oh, I like okay. to think that I go out and I see all the sights. I sleep and I see if I can like find a Nordstrom and go shopping. It's not in a not a worldly way to live. I look at friends of mine that are comics that aren't particularly successful, don't have a lot of money, but they're so grateful for what they get to do. It's such an honor to do what we do or even just to have a job that makes you happy because so few people do. Just the fact that I don't have to get up if I don't want to in the morning. It sounds like I was going to kill myself. I don't have to really do anything that I don't want to do. And as a comic, you don't have you don't report to anyone. You can say what you want to say and people want to hear that. And so I think I get irked when I see comics that don't take it seriously or don't have a fire inside them or get shit-faced and come on stage or are rude to management or something like that. It's like you're so lucky to have this job. And just because you're successful doesn't mean you can start fucking off. Is this going to – can I curse? Yes, you can. And you just did. I did it. You saved it till the end, but you did it. A big F-bomb. Wow. Sure. Yeah, keep, <laughs> keep telling yourself that. And it's true. I think you're right. Great seeing you again. Thanks for having me again. Well, thank you. For watching me eat earlier. That, that was the highlight. Eliza, we'll talk to you next time you're in town. Thank you. I hope so. Okay, bye-bye. The delightful. Effervescent. Eliza Schlesinger. It was fun talking to her. She's a good, she's a good person. You know, in my uh, one hour and what last time we spoke was maybe 40 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes of talking with her, I could tell. She's a good person. Funny too. So, hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for listening. And tune in again next Sunday night right here on 100.5 FM CFRO. I'll be back.